Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran, ordering a digital audio interface from Amazon, or else a scrappy upstart, Driving to rural West Virginia to purchase an antiquated two-inch tape machine, this is your show, because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's the first Friday of September 2021, and I thank you for joining us This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle, built by musicians and for musicians. Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made, and it would always be some guy named Victor who drove a Mitsubishi Outlander with brushed nickel rims and who was always trying to sell you Oxycontin that he had packaged in M&M's minis containers. An old Victor would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months, but it's the future now, you guys. That's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in, hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates, tools to sell your music and merch commission-free. Listeners to the Working Songwriter Podcast can go to bandzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, I'm over on YouTube for Sunday Songs. That's a live stream. I'm live. I'm playing tunes. I'm taking questions in the live chat. I'm taking requests in the live chat. It's a really fun, really interactive experience. I dare to say that we're building something of a community over there on Sunday nights, including many people who are listeners to this podcast. So come on over and be a part of it every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on YouTube. Head over to YouTube and search for Joe Pug or go to joepugmusic.com and click on the live stream tab. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. You search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name. Then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would give the price of a cup of coffee every month, it would make an immense difference. So thank you. To everybody who's taken the time to do that, I really appreciate you. And if you're not in a place where you can contribute in that way, there's still a few ways that you could help out the show. First, you could leave us a ratings in the iTunes store. Or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Our guest this week is the principal songwriter of the Felice Brothers, a mainstay of American Roots music for the last few decades. Ian Felice grew up in the Hudson River Valley and got his start in music by busking the streets and subways of New York City with his brothers. Eventually, they made their way into some of Gotham's entry-level venues, and then a legendary performance in the rain at the Newport Folk Festival took them on to the national stage. They've recorded for Loose, 
Fat Possum, Team Love, and Yep Rock Records. They've toured with Bright Eyes, Justin Towns Earl, Gillian Welch, Old Crow Medicine Show, and Dave Matthews Band. They've appeared at Bonnaroo, Outside Lands, and the Philadelphia Folk Festival. Spin Magazine says that they specialize in boozy, rambling tales of backwoods nostalgia. Rolling Stone has dubbed their latest release Stark and Stirring. And Filter's Good Music Guide once said of the group, What separates the Felice's mud-stomping folk from that of their peers is their no-winking honesty. The sense that these songs and the places and people they're singing about aren't literary devices, but actual people doing their damnedest to rage against the growing darkness. I caught up with Ian on the phone earlier this week to hear about his journey so far. Ian Felice, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. Uh, This has been an exciting interview for me because I feel like our musical paths have crossed in a lot of ways over the last 10 or 15 years, but we've never met. So uh, this is... We've never met. That's true, right? (laughs) I think so. We've probably been on 10 gigs here or there, but... uh, I'm sure we played some festivals together or something. Definitely, man. So um, you guys got your start... Well even before you got your start playing with your brother, you guys growing up in the Catskills, what did music look like in your family and and in the area up there? It's a really musical region up there. It is a musical region. Um, You wouldn't know it unless you kind of tried to research it. There wasn't a huge scene or anything. I mean, my parents didn't play music at all. Um, Just working people that worked too much to play music, I guess. Um, but there is, you know, the old relics of the 60s kind of folk scene. Um, people were still up there like John Harold, who's a great bluegrass musician. Um, um, there was no venues per se where I lived. I lived in the woods it's in Pennellville. So, um, but there were, like I said, there were some folk musicians and, you know, there was the legacy of the area, which was important, I guess. So do you think you think it was then, you know, folks who were part of that folk revolution um, in New York City who maybe kind of moved out to upstate New York um, after its heyday? Like, you think that's where it kind of got its genesis and its kind of musical flavor up there? I think so, but it, it was before that, really. I mean, it was it was a visual arts kind of colony for a long time up here, um, even in like the 1800s. And there was a lot of music, obviously, that comes with that, too. Um, but yeah, yeah, the most famous example is from the 60s when like Dylan and Jimi Hendrix and these people were living up here um, in the band, of course. Um, but then, you know, there's been a lot of other folk musicians, um, lesser known ones, you know, that are equally as good. When did music become a part of your life? Like, when did it become something? When did it go from something that you would listen to on the radio or the record player and go to something that you were doing yourself? I started playing music when I was around. I started playing the bagpipes for some strange reason oh, when, I was like eight. <laughs> when I was like eight or nine. Um, I got a set of bagpipes and I learned. I went to like a teacher. So I grew up playing folk, uh, like Irish and Scottish folk songs with the bagpipes. Um, and I did the whole marching and the parades and all that when I was very small. <laughs> little guy and um then i kind of you know grew out of that when i got into high school and i started to play guitar more and and piano and i started to listen to a lot of folk music and um jimmy rogers and i mean i guess first i started to listen to what my mom listened to which was Joni mitchell and bob dylan this record new morning was like the the uh soundtrack to my 
youth and Joni Mitchell's blue and Nashville skyline and um, Neil Young, um, Leonard Cohen, you know, all those, you know, monsters of folk. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, and then I got into the earlier stuff, probably through Dylan, honestly, because he's, you know, he talks about all the blues singers and got into Willie McTell and then from there, Robert Johnson. And then, you know, it just all the Piedmont blues artists and I fell in love with music from the 30s and 40s when I was in high school. And um, but I didn't ever think I was going to play that. I, I never thought I'd be a musician for like a living like that. That was never a thought yeah, that right. came, it came into my mind until I was like in my early 20s. And I thought, you know, That's maybe funny, I could give it a try. Still- Immersed, I mean, playing the bagpipes at eight and then getting all, into all like these deep cuts in high school, really fairly obscure music. Uh, and, and yet still, you, you didn't feel like music was going to be a path that you did professionally. It was just a hobby or, or a love of yours early on. Yeah, it was a love of mine. And I didn't I had other friends like better at music. Than, I didn't think that I was <laughs> that talented at it. I was I and I was focusing a lot at on um, painting and I was you know I got into painting in college and I got a scholarship to study art and I went to Italy and studied painting so I, maybe like since I was like 15 to like when I was 23 I was just focused on on making paintings but then I just my life got turned a bit upside down and I started a band with my brothers and then yeah, it's called the Felice Brothers and then <laughs> that's it. Uh, it's funny you mentioned there that uh you know one of the reasons that you didn't think music might be your path is because you were around other musicians who were more talented than you were i had the same experience a lot of musicians who end up doing it for a living I feel like people can really like list off people early on who were just much better than them uh, <laughs> yeah, so- you know and uh, but it just kind of shows that it doesn't just take talent to to do it for a living you have to be someone who loves it and gets committed to it because to do it over the long haul, you know, 10, 15 years longer than that. Um, there's a lot of other uh, uh, character attributes that you have to have together to, to keep it together and keep it going. And I've watched very talented people, um, you know, drop out sooner rather than later pretty often. Totally. You need a lot of character attributes, you know, some of them are not so you know you need like hubris you know you need like <laughs> yeah stupidity to think like oh i'm actually you know this is important what i'm doing <laughs> when it's usually, when it's usually not you know you young yeah. people are good at that <laughs> of thinking yeah. that they're like what you know that they're on top of the world or something that's it yeah and you need you know yeah, be a little bit weird and <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, it, yeah. You you have to think what you're doing is important, even if 99 times out of 100 it isn't. You have to be prepared for that one time out of 100. <laughs> you know. Yeah, 100. Yeah. So that's a pretty that's a left turn that you took there. If you were painting and painting very seriously from you know about 15 to 23, 17 to 23, whatever you said there, uh, to then go start that band with your brothers, is that the period in your life where you guys started playing? I know you started busking in New York City. Is that how things started? And is, is that when the left turn began for you? Yeah, that is. I made a record of songs um, that I wrote over when I was younger. Um, I probably wrote them from when I was like 19 or 18 to 22 when I recorded them. When I was like 23, it was called Ian Town. And then that was like <laughs> the the kind of that was the beginning of the band basically. And then we all got together, and then we moved to the city. This was in twenty two thousand and six. Um, and yeah, we started busking. I mean, we didn't know how to play <laughs> music at all. I mean, we were pretty bad, um, very bad, probably. Um, but we were passionate and we were just living by, you know, it was like our religion, our philosophy, our worldview, our whole, our whole 
life, you know, we devoted to it for many years and we got okay and we got better and better. But it was always the songs, you know, that were the most important. The music was always not as, you know, we knew that we weren't great musicians, (laughs) but we knew that we could write pretty good songs, you know. So we we leaned on that strength, I think. It's totally, I feel like it's totally different uh, muscles that allow you to, one muscle allows you to write good songs and one muscle allows you to be like a virtuoso musician or have musicianship that is uh, um, otherworldly. And man, I have very rarely seen it cross over into both. I mean, you know, there's Prince and a couple other people, man, but <laughs> it's really tough to do both of those things. Yeah, it is. Mm. I mean, if you're so good at playing your instrument, it's kind of like, what? what's the point? <laughs> I'll just do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? You got to find something you're good at and do it, I guess. But yeah, yeah, it's kind of like opposite sides of the brain. There's like the technical side and then there's the creative side. Yes. You know, when when they when they kind of meet in the middle, that's when you're doing something good, I think. Yeah, I love it that you guys made the plan to move to New York City. And most people who moved to New York City at that time to, quote unquote, you know, make it in entertainment or music like they're out getting like head shops, head shots printed at Kinko's <laughs> and, and you guys were like, uh, how about this? We're not going to worry about playing Arlene's Gross. We, we were just going to play on the on the street outside and try to make some cold, hard cash here. Yeah, dude, we had to go out to dinner. We had to go to Chinatown to get, get the dumplings, man. But you, were you making <laughs> any dough? I mean, I'm sure you were making some actual dough doing that. If you were doing <laughs> We were, yeah. yeah. We hit some good spots, dude. We made like a few hundred bucks a day. But we just blow it. We literally just blow it on, on dinner every night. <laughs> um, but it was like, it wasn't a, I mean, there was not that many options, honestly. It was a different time. And it's like, we don't, we didn't know how to get gigs. So we just made our own. We just started playing. And then we'd get asked, you know, for a restaurant would come out and be like, either they'd be like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> or they'd be like, <laughs> like you want to come play in our restaurant we'll like feed you and give you 50 bucks and we're like yeah that sounds great love that you know and then we moved on to bars and you know clubs eventually it uh that really does make you i mean well that's literally singing for your supper there but do you feel like that that kind of that, that experience was formative to what you guys still do now like like do you still make records on some level knowing that the record has to be good enough to almost in like a metaphorical sense get the restaurant owner to invite you in for dinner and 50 bucks rather than <laughs> you know what i mean no, yeah. like i'm kind of being glib but i'm yeah. kind of not yeah that impulse it doesn't leave you you know if you if you <laughs> if you, that's how you've been brought up i don't think it goes away you just we, we, I feel like I'm still just like scrapping on the street most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, um, uh, when I was in high school, I used to, I, I grew up outside of DC in Maryland. I used to take the Metro into DC and play uh, in front of the museums on weekends. And, um, I, I find even all these years later that it, it kind of put a stamp on me in that there's been some positive parts of it that I've, that I took away to be sure, but I feel like a negative part sometimes is when I'm, when I'm trying to create work, when I'm trying to create songs or, or a whole album, I can find myself in a mode of wanting to, to please people and please listeners in the short term, rather than pleasing myself and pleasing the listener in the long term. Um, and I can almost draw, like draw a straight line between that kind of impulse, draw a straight line all the way back to when I was just like, man, <laughs> let me play this same song three times <laughs> as I know I'm going to get, you know, five, 10, 15 bucks from it. Yeah. I feel you. Yeah. That that's, that's real, but I think it's a pretty dangerous, you know, you have to get away from that, you know, to be, you have to, eventually you just have to say, fuck it. I have to make what makes me happy, you know, or else it's just, it's just, it, it feels contrived after a certain point. Right. Definitely. What was the point for you? Do you remember a time when you took that fork in the road and, and went a different direction and changed things in that sense? 
honestly, I, I've always kind of been kind of, I, I don't know if I've ever tried to make music that other people would like, honestly. Um, <laughs> I usually, you know, I usually have songs on a record that I don't particularly like as much as the other ones. And those are, are always the songs that other people like them. <laughs> you know, there's always like the ones that I'm just like, uh, that, that generally people gravitate towards, but I understand that everyone likes their own kind of music, you know, but I try, I've never, I've, I've never, I don't think I've ever written songs to try to please anyone else but myself. I don't know. That that is uh that is a rare talent right there. And I, I respect that a lot. Do you uh how did you guys move from uh those you know kind of hard scrabble beginnings to you know uh I mean now you're 10 or 15 years in making a living as a musician, you know, in the music business doing your thing like what was what got you off the street there and you know on the road playing gigs stuff like that like what was the big switch there um it was gradual progression um we got a van we got a, a you know and we started to book show actual shows and then we got a a great booking agent uh, ground control who booked Bright Eyes and then Connor took us on the road and um, that was probably a big shift for us. We started, you know, being able to plan tours after that. And uh, yeah, Connor and Bright Eyes have been a big help in the early days and still are. Um, yeah, and other artists that also took us out on the road and I mean, supporting bigger artist is important when you're starting out for sure um and you know we just focused we focused on making songs and making the best songs that we could and staying true to our our vision and you know it it, i mean it gradually got more comfortable and more feasible it it does seem from what I've always read about you guys, that Bright Eyes and Connor Obers were a big, a formative influence and a formative, you know, friend uh, in the business to you guys. What, what did you guys learn um, from that outfit artistically? And, and what did you learn from them on how to get by uh, playing music for a living on the business side? I mean, so much. I mean, just listening to Bright Eyes in the early days we're on tour with them just Connor's devotion to his craft and his, how good of a songwriter he was, was inspiring his lyrics because we both kind of, l- lyrics are the most important part of, you know, songwriting for both of us. So we really bonded over that. And um, I think he really helped me push my writing in a good direction. Um, and, you know, and, and he's also, you know, a very smart businessman, and he, <laughs> which is funny to say, but um, he, you know, he taught us how to navigate some things about the industry and stuff. And, you know, we're still learning and developing and growing together, I think, as friends and artists. Yeah, you know, it's funny it, when you have to give a chuckle when you describe him in that way as a businessman. And I know what you mean, uh, but, you know, I've learned over the years that, you know, just because someone isn't wearing, uh, you know, a three piece suit and, you know, has a watch chain and, and <laughs> a cigar doesn't mean they don't know what the hell's going on. I've, I've always heard from people, you know, in in and around uh, Dylan's world that even at the age that he is now, he he knows it exactly what's going on with every gig he knows the deal on every yeah gig. For sure. like all that type of stuff even now you know you can tell you can't be become that successful without being like having that part of you know characteristic you know you can't or, or if you do get that successful it just makes things spin out of control in such a wild and precipitous fashion that it just comes crumbling down really quick totally, totally. 
Yeah. Uh, money is gasoline, man. And that can, it can add, add to a fire that you're trying to make a rocket ship go off the ground with, or it can help you self-immolate, but it's gasoline one way or the other, you know? Yeah. For sure. Um, did you, uh, how did you handle um, touring early on? Because that is a different thing, man, like getting in a van and heading on the road, you know, in your 20s, uh, away from all family and friends, except for your little crew in the van. Um, did you take to the touring life and enjoy it? Or did it put a stress on you like or somewhere in between? What was your experience with it? I loved it. I mean, it did put a stress physically like I like it was hard. We I ended up in the hospital, you know. At really? some point, because we were just pushing too hard, playing too many shows um, in a row and traveling and just drinking too much and just, you know, just living like psychopaths, sleeping in, you know, the parking lots of Walmart for like months, months on end. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like I could oh, never, I, do. I, I oh. can never go back to that situation, you know, um, but it's a period in your life you got to do. Um, but I loved it. I loved traveling. I loved, you know, just being transient. I mean, it just, it's a good feeling for me. And I didn't love playing music. I mean, I didn't love like performing back then. I I, I liked more the travel and the, the, the adventure of the whole situation. And the, the music was kind of like the means by which I could do that. <laughs> Um, I like music and writing music, but the, the performing, was, performing was, you know, it was hard on me a little bit. Um, but that's changed as i grow grown older. I don't like traveling as much, but I actually I do like to sing songs for people and, and to share our music with people now. So there's been a shift there. And um, I think it's good. <sighs> Hopefully growing somehow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 but yeah, touring is it's insane. There, there was something really. I mean, I spent my twenties in the same way. I used to come home from tours, and uh, my now wife, then girlfriend, we, she'd always say when I come home from a tour, I would just be gray, like my my skin <laughs> would be gray because all I did was just pretty much eat McDonald's for two months, smoke a pack of cigarettes a day, and yeah. just drink hard liquor every night, and. It does sound like a nightmare to me now. I'm not going to lie, but I'm 37 now. But at 27, 25, 26, 27, like it was pretty much how I envisioned my life going when I was a kid. <laughs> I was having a great yeah. time. It's paradise. It's just, you know, you it's guys, just we were both. Um, I know I, I did a ton of touring with Justin Towns Earl at that time. I know you guys did a fair amount. You at least did some tours of Australia with him. Is that right? Or, or you did some more? Did we do Australia with him? I think, oh, yeah, I we, I don't know. Did, maybe. we did huge tours with him in, in the States in like 08. Yeah. Um, and we, yeah, we traveled all around. He was just, it was the duo with him and Corey. Yeah. Um, he just plays in Old Crow now. I think I don't know, um, and then yeah, and then we had a big tour called the Big Surprise Tour that was had Gillian Welsh and Old Crow and Dave Rollins and us and um, Justin Towns. Well, that was in '09. That was a good big tour as well. As far as my musical taste goes, that's a pretty much that's an all timer tour right there, man. I, that was that was a fun tour, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I remember, so I picked up with him pretty much right after when he had moved, I guess Corey joined, joined Old Crow, and that's when Headley uh, picked up with Justin and Bryn Davies was playing bass. And there was just such a feeling at that time for Justin in particular, where like, it was one of those tours where the they booked the clubs at a time um, where they thought that the demand was going to be a lot less, and then everything sold out because he was just kind of taken off. And it was just such a magical it was awesome for me to be along for that ride and to watch like the zeitgeist pick up someone in their music in real time. It was an amazing thing to watch. It sounds like you guys were around uh, to see that as well. Yeah. Yeah, it was. I remember that time as well. Yeah. He was such a great, talented, sweet person, man. It's very sad. Yeah. And he, I mean, he had his way with an audience, man. He, he really, 
he was like an old school performer. He was like the type of performer that would like get into it with a heckler. Uh, for like, <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Old school one. We would get into it with the club owners and back in the day. Oh, yeah. And just, we would, yeah, we were insane. <laughs> Did, wait, you guys would, or are you talking about Justin? At one time, I think this one club owner didn't pay Justin for um, his gig for some fucked up reason. And then, like, he called the club owners, like, I'm sending the Felice brothers over there to kick your ass. <laughs> I mean, he called us up. It was like, yo, <laughs> got to get my bag. I think it was in Minneapolis. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it, we've had some, some times together. <laughs> Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. When I was growing up, I admired and wanted to be like artists and poets. Now today, our creative class goes under a different set of designations and labels, sometimes called influencers or self-described content creators, and that's fine. I'm not going to begrudge a new generation its jargon, but I will say it seems like Ian fits squarely into that old-school class of artists, people who did not concern themselves with marketing or brand synergy or, frankly, any expectations that were put on them at all. There's a wonderful poem by Alex Dimitrov that speaks to the pain that comes with concerning yourself with those things. It's entitled, Monday. I was just beginning to wonder about my own life, and now I have to return to it, regardless of the weather or how close I am to love. Doesn't it bother you sometimes what living is, what the day has turned into? So many screens and meetings and things to be late for. Everyone truly deserves a flute of champagne for having made it this far, though it's such a disaster to drink on a Monday. To imagine who you would be if you hadn't crossed the street or married, if you hadn't agreed to the job or the money, or how time just keeps going. Whoever agreed to that has clearly not seen the beginning of summer, or been to a party, or let themselves float in the middle of a book where, for however briefly, it's possible to stay longer than you should. Unfortunately for me and you, we have the rest of it to get to. We must pretend there's a blue painting at the end of this poem, and every time we look at it, 
we forget about ourselves. And every time it looks at us, it forgives us for pain. You described a period of time there where you were, you know, very seriously painting, very individual art and pursuing that, while at the same time you wrote this entire first record. It sounds like you're very prolific when it comes down to sitting down and just creating work and, and channeling stuff. Do you still feel like that way today when you sit down at a desk or sit down in a studio or wherever you write? Like, do you still have that same connection to um, source material, for lack of a better word? Definitely, even more so. I'm more focused yeah. now. But I've always, the impulse has always been there to make stuff. Um, I think it's kind of like a distraction for me. It just takes me out of reality for a while. And I like to just live in my own world of my own creating for a while and just, mm, just disconnect, honestly. I think that's where it stems from. And but it just you comes, like you know, every day. I do it every day for hours. What do you think you're disconnecting from uh, that you find uh, pleasure in? Um, I'm just like turning off the sound, the static of the world, all the bullshit and just kind of trying to, I mean, trying to, you know, connect to something that's more important. Generally. Um yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I just when you get focused in the zone, you just you're in the zone. You just you're by, by yourself, and there's nothing, there's nothing that could distract you really. So I think that's part of it. And I have a beautiful studio now on my property. I just come really? down. Hey, yeah, I just come down here every day and work. Been making a lot of paintings. Um, yeah, there's this old church on my property. It's like from 1873. It's like a one room kind of. It's a one-room church, um, wow. and it was the the congregation got like too small and couldn't upkeep it, and so um, I I purchased it and I renovated it, and that's where we recorded our new record, and this is where I work and make make paintings and music and stuff. Man, I don't have any space that sounds quite as uh, holy as that, but I'll tell you this, it has blown my mind uh, being older. I've always, uh, in the last few years, made it a point to have a dedicated space uh, for doing work uh, in a studio, and it has really blown my mind what a big difference it makes having a dedicated yeah. space. It's the, it's the whole deal, almost. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, you need a spot to just... Focus. Turn off your phone. Yes. Do the work. Turn off the phone. And then it's weird. Like at a certain point, it almost has like this Pavlovian response. And you like once you walk into the space, it your your subconscious begins to drool in a way. Like it it knows like now this is the time. Yeah. You, <laughs> you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Spaces uh, are very important to me. They are. So you write and you record in there. Are you pretty handy? Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm horrible at recording. Um, my brother James, he, he's really sharp at it. It's really good. He, do, he does all the engineering and stuff. I mean, it took me like three hours to try to figure out how to hook this mic up to do this interview. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm still not sure if it's going to work. I appreciate you. I was like, send, I'm like sending James photos of like the mic and like, where should I put this microphone? <laughs> okay. You know, I do think it's important though uh, for any creative outfit, even if one person doesn't know what's going on. Like I think in this day and age, um, any songwriter in their creative outfit, they, they have to have someone that can do um, recording or who are at least fluent in it because it's such an important part. Knowing the medium is such an important part of getting the ideas across, you know? Well, yeah, hundred percent. I wish I had more knowledge about it. I just don't think I'm good at it. And, you know, when you grow up together and, you know, you start a band, people adapt, you know, and they, they become good at things that need to be people to become good at you know what i mean yes. 
yes. develop, you know, there's your strengths contrary to one another to, to build the strength of the group, you know. They do. And yet, like the flip side of that coin that's really funny is, you know, the things that you're never going to be strong at, I find with myself, like if there's something I say to myself, like I should really learn how to do this, it would really help me artistically. Um, but you ever find yourself knowing that you should do that and then getting down to having to do it and you simply cannot make yourself pay attention to it for even a minute? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, ADD. Um, but the thing is like, yeah, ADD to a certain degree, but then when I am interested in something, and it sounds like when you are, cause you're talking about getting lost for hours and something, when I am interested in something, it's the opposite of ADD. I, I can be lost in it, but if I'm not interested in it, it just, you know, you couldn't put hot coals to my feet and make me pay attention to it, man. Hmm. Interesting. Um, how do oh, we oh, I got you back. I think I'm, I'm, I lost you for a little while. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, how do you think besides the space that you've set up and having a space to do it, like how has your creative and your writing process changed um, from that first record uh, to now, if it has at all? It has changed a lot. Um, I used to write, um, it's become, <laughs> it's so hard to talk about your process, but over the past few years, I think the music and the lyrics have drifted apart a bit. And so they're not, when I started to write originally, the, this, the music, the melody and the lyrics were kind of codependent on each other to exist. Now, when I write, I write a lot of poetry. And a lot of times I can develop lyrical ideas independent of melodies, and then I can um, kind of change the meter of the, of the poem to fit within the melody that I've written. So it's almost become two disciplines at this point where I can write melodies and I can write music and I can do this separate practice, which is write poems and they can become, you know, they can be melded together. But this is new. I haven't been doing this for too long. I used to write all of it at the same time, mm -hmm. you know, so. Are the songs sounding different because of the new method? Um, I don't know. Yeah, they, yeah, I think they're changing, hopefully. Um. That's just a general statement. There's, you know, there's nuance. And there's everything, every song and thing I make is different, you know, process that kind of I figure out while I'm writing it. It's funny. I, I've actually kind of gone the complete opposite direction. I, I used to write when I started out the way that you're describing there, you, you know, completely starting with kind of blank verse or, or poetry and then putting it into a song and I've kind of gone more into writing it all at the same time. And the reason was I started really running into this problem where I work for hours and hours and hours on a poem to get like, you know, these couple of tiny words exactly right. And then as soon as I took them to the guitar, I knew in like 15 seconds at the guitar that it wasn't going to work. As yeah, so, so, yeah, it's yeah so. man. I just burned like eight hours working <laughs> on this. And if I had the guitar in my hand in the first place, I would have known in 15 seconds that it was fucked, you know? Yeah. Totally. It's such a different lyrics and poems are so different, you know? Yeah. That's one, once you become aware of that and understand the differences between mm, the two, between lyrics and poetry, I think it helps to separate them. You can separate them and it, but I don't know. It's all a mystery really. Who knows? <laughs> it, it is the only thing that i can find out about the mystery is just using my own interest as a compass to be like if i'm interested in it right now and i want to work this way then i'm going to work that way and we're going that way and i don't know why but this is it's almost you know using your own interest as a uh as a north star to, to trust that that is what you should be doing then definitely yeah and cutting out all the wasted energy and time like you said it took you eight hours to make write a few lines and then it was you know once you realize like 
how to um how to st- streamline what you're doing so you're not wasting time that's but it's all about the old nuances of your own brain and process you know so there's not a single way to do it you have to figure out how your own brain works and then like figure out tricks to you know, make it work for you if that I mean, makes any if that makes any sense i don't know <laughs> it does i mean well and one of those tricks it kind of goes back to something that you said earlier like the idea of heading to your space and and tuning out all the noise uh that's going on in the world to get to something more what i would call eternal uh if you're talking about something that's beautiful something that's true um and we live in a world right now where there's like there's a lot of noise man there's oh, yeah. a lot of noise going on there's a lot of opinions day to day and um it's hard to be an artist in that world because you can find yourself sometimes i find myself uh uh, writing towards something that might not be eternal, might not be true or beautiful, but something that would be expedient for the day, you know? Yeah, that's dangerous too. Yeah. It's a hard balance, you know, living in this world. You got to... I, I live in the woods and we didn't have internet for like three years or service on my cell phone. Mm-hmm. And we just... <laughs> it was pretty great. But then we got internet and there's so much distraction, you know? What did, man, I feel like if I lived without internet for three years, it would literally on a biological level rewire my brain in some way. Do you feel like that at all? Yeah. Let's take a break for sure. Oh. Hello? Hey, oh, can you get you to have me? Yeah, yeah, so, I got you now. So yeah, I keep losing you because my like like I said, I live in like a dead zone and I have my internet oh, okay. pretty bad. Well, I so. I was gonna say that uh, you know, if I lived, as you just said, if I lived for uh three years without internet, uh, I feel like it would on a biological level rewire my brain uh, in some ways. Do you feel like it did that to you at all? It definitely does. Yeah, there's no, no doubt about it. There's scientific research to back it up. It, it totally changes your whole, you know, your mood and your your level of happiness and everything is connected to it. So it's, you know, it's designed by neuros neuroscientists so just keep you like addicted to it so <laughs> you know it's a drug essentially so yeah it does change you your brain for sure yeah i mean i've 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 been addicted to plenty of things in my life but that would internet would probably be the only one designed by well-paid neuroscientists to do it right. <laughs> actually that's not right i guess there's been a few uh, there's probably been a few pills designed in some way to, to do the same thing <laughs> Um, well, right on then. Well, before I, I let you go here, tell me a little bit about this new record that you guys recorded in this new space. And, 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 you know, was the process different this time because you guys were in that new space of yours? And if so, how it affected the new piece of work that you have on your hands here? It was a really easy, fun, enjoyable um, experience. It was, you know, we hadn't played together for like eight or nine months because of COVID. And then we all got together and we were pretty ecstatic to just make music. And it just, I think it kind of came through on the recordings. I mean, we only, we cut for like four or five days and made the whole record. So, um, and it was just fun. There was nothing that wasn't enjoyable about it. Um, And we just recorded it by ourselves basically with our buddy. Nate Wood, who's a brilliant engineer and musician, helped us out with engineering. And um, it's just a continuation of what we've been doing, hopefully growth. And, you know, I, I'm very excited for people to hear it. I mean, it just feels like it takes an eternity for these things to come out. Sure. I mean, it was a year ago that we recorded it. so, And it's coming out in a few weeks, I think, so... Did you guys take those, uh, the tracks that you recorded yourself and you take them to a separate mix engineer to have them? Yeah, mixed? Mike Mogus from Bright Eyes, he he mixed it and he played some Mark on it and some guitar, uh, you know, and some pedal steel. Um, he did a beautiful job and Nate Walcott um, played some horns on a couple tracks and, you know, it's just... 
Oh, what were you going to say? Well, we're living in a brave new world as far as all that goes. I'm, I'm finishing a record right now that's mainly been tracked by myself or, or tracked by the musicians who were uh, recording remotely and sending it to a mix engineer. And technology and mix engineers have gotten to a point where everything is pretty forgiving as far as like the source files that you give them. Like I, I delivered a couple of things that like the parts themselves were kind of cool, but maybe the audio fidelity was a bummer. And what the yeah. engineers are able to do now um, with that type of stuff is pretty insane. I think. Yeah, we're in the world yeah, I love that. <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I, love, I love that development. I mean, I listen to Charlie Patton records, and I think they sound great. I mean, I listen back to my voice memos, and I'm like, oh, that's done. <laughs> you know, I just, I don't, I don't, I'm not an audio file. You know, I don't really care about. Um, the quality that much of, of recordings but yeah it is amazing how it's going everyone you can just make a record on a laptop and just it can be like the number one record in the world I know. it doesn't really matter anymore that's great it's a really liberating development i think especially for young artists that are don't have dough to go into the studio you know it's funny them. I was just referencing some mixes for an album coming up and uh, my dad came down to my studio and he noticed that I, I hadn't set up the, um, I hadn't set up my studio monitors to listen to the mix. I would just been listening to it on like Apple earbuds. And he was like, what are you doing, man? Like, shouldn't you reference that on like these really nice studio speakers here? And I was like, <laughs> man, I'm just at a point where I'm like, 99% of people are going to be listening to the album in these earbuds. So yeah. I'm going to listen to them in my car and in these earbuds. And if they're good there, we're good. <laughs> you yeah, know? that's a good, that's a good way to go for sure. Um, are you guys hitting the road uh, behind this release? I mean, that's the idea. Hopefully, <clears throat> I don't know. It's all so precarious and uncertain. This whole, this, this whole world at this point. I mean, I want to play music on one hand, but the other hand, I don't want to, you know, put people's, you know, health in jeopardy. And yeah. It's a whole balance, man. I need to go out on the road to make money. You know, but it's also and, you know, it's my livelihood and that's what I love to do. But it's also like, I don't know if it's I don't know what to do, honestly. Well, we're going on tour as yeah. of now. And, you know, we're going to do an actual, basically an actual tour. And then next summer we're going to the UK and, and Europe. So, yeah, that's awesome. man. Well, dude, I really appreciate you taking the time to be on uh, the podcast. And I, I wish you the very so best. much for having me. It's a real honor. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. The Felice Brothers' forthcoming album is entitled From Dreams to Dust, available everywhere music is sold or streamed on September 17th. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember, an expensive drug habit is not a song, a compelling Instagram account is not a song, and most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself, and for you, just keep your eye on the song.